Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Maggie Ortiz Milan, Director of Programs at EERI. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Okay, before we get started, I want to say a few words about EERI for those of you who may not be familiar. The Earthquake Engineering Research Institute is the leading nonprofit membership organization that collects multidisciplinary professionals dedicated to advancing earthquake resilience in the U.S. and around the world. Through its activities, EERI provides members with the technical knowledge, leadership and advocacy skills, collaborative networks, and multidisciplinary context to achieve earthquake resilience in their communities. By joining EERI, you become a member of our global network of multidisciplinary professionals. To learn more or join EERI, you can visit eeri.org slash join. This webinar is being presented as part of the EERI Learning from Earthquakes program, or LFE. Through LFE, EERI conducts multidisciplinary reconnaissance and shares lessons learned from earthquakes around the world. You can learn more about the Learning from Earthquakes program on the LFE website, at learningfromearthquakes.org, which contains information on over 300 earthquakes from 50 countries. Next year will mark the 50th anniversary of the LFE program, and the 2023 ERI annual meeting will celebrate this anniversary with a program focused on reconnaissance. The meeting will take place April 11 through 14, 2023, and more information will be available on the ERI website soon. The Learning from Earthquakes program is funded through through the, through the support of EERI members and the generous contributions of LFE Endowment Fund donors. The LFE Endowment Fund ensures that events like this webinar are available for free. To learn more about how to contribute to the LFE Endowment Fund, you can visit eeri.org slash donate. This summer, EERI renewed a Memorandum of Understanding with SMIS, the Mexican Society of Earthquake Engineering. The MOU outlines opportunities for partnership between EERI and SMIS, and we're happy to pre present today's webinar as a joint activity in the spirit of this new agreement. Now I'll turn it over to Hector Guerrero Bobadillo, SMIS president, to say a few words about SMIS. Thank you again to the EERI and to all of the collaborators, to the staff, the president as well for this collaboration. We are very happy to work jointly and let me just present a couple of slides, if you will allow me. I would like to start by thanking especially our speakers today and all of you for participating in this seminar. Let me talk briefly about the Mexican Society of Seismic Engineering, which is a non for profit created in 1962. In fact, this year we are turning 60 years of existence with an event of celebration only a couple of months ago. And we are so thankful to be a part of contributions, you know, so that Mexican engineering can really contribute to this field. It was created by very acknowledged engineers in Mexico. The Smith is a, a dis multidisciplinary uh, association with a scientific and technological nature that has as purpose to study and disseminate the seismic phenomenon as well as to collect data and experiences against um, natural risks and earthquake. The SMIS has a objective to gather people interested in seismic engineering issues in order to exchange know-how, experiences, technological research through the organization of courses, seminars, roundtables, congresses, etc. We are very thankful to have you all with us, especially our speakers. It's a pleasure to collaborate with the EERI. Initially, we started working with this uh, virtual um, reconnaissance briefing led by Dr. Miranda. We would like to thank him for his leadership in carrying out this activity. And today we will reflect on what we learned about this earthquake. Please keep on following the activities of the Smiths, especially in Facebook. This is the um, address Sociedad Mexicana de Ingeniería Sísmica. We usually publish all of our activities there to make them available to all of you. We are so grateful for your participation and we are certain that this close collaboration with the EERI will provide our communities with great benefits. Thank you so much. So today we'll be hearing from several speakers on the impacts of the most recent September 19th earthquake in Mexico. We'll have time at the end of the webinar for audience questions. Please submit your questions using the Q&A tool during the presentations. 
First, Dr. Eduardo Miranda will provide an overview of the earthquake. Dr. Miranda is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University, specializing in performance-based earthquake engineering. He also serves as the co-chair of the Learning from Earthquakes Committee. Eduardo. Thank you, Maggie. So just before we start, um, I would like to give my elevator pitch about uh, Learning from Earthquakes program. Uh, when I was an undergraduate student at UNAM in Mexico City, there was a huge earthquake uh, on September 19, 1985, and it was my first experience of what uh, you know a very large destructive earthquake was. And uh, as a result of that, I basically decided to dedicate my life uh, to the mitigation of earthquakes in society. And soon after I arrived to the United States, I learned about this organization whose mission was exactly what I was trying to achieve. And I joined immediately. So it's sort of like if you like Baroque music and you see a, a poster on the street saying that they will be playing uh, the Messiah from uh, Hendel, you know, you just join right away and you don't see any additional advertising. And, and I wanna give you one example of what we do at LFE. This is an image that I'm sure many of you have seen from uh, April 18, uh, 1906 here in San Francisco. And this image was not taken by an earthquake engineering or by a specialist, yet there's so much to learn. And I put it in class and I asked the students, you know, why do these chimneys in the uh, up front, even though they are on ring four masonry and uh, they're very slender, why they did not collapse? And uh, of course, the, the answer is because there was some bracing uh, on them which it, now you don't see because of the of the fire. And, uh, and one of the things you would like to learn was the fire before the earthquake or the earthquake before the fire. And this kind of things, maybe in the future, uh, neural networks and, and, and deep learning and all those tools will be able to help us. But at this point, I challenge everybody, including my colleagues here at Stanford, some of the best computer vision specialists, which right now they can distinguish between a dog and a cat, but probably would not be able to tell us uh, that there was an earthquake before this fire. Uh, whereas with people and the help of young individuals, any of you would be able to, to tell us exactly what it is. So just a couple of days ago, I, there was an event here at Stanford uh, on non-structural components. And I was reminding them about the importance about learning from earthquakes. And I show this slides, the two on the left from the Good Friday, 1964 Alaska earthquake. And, and we're talking about non-structural components and I was referring to those panels. And then I reminding them about the important words of uh, George Santayana, a, a Spaniard who immigrated to the United States and became a professor at Harvard. And he said, those of you who forget about history, you're bound to repeat it. And unfortunately, this is what happened to us and October 1st, 1987, uh, we saw something very similar. And again, some persons were killed because of precast panels. So our mission, it's really to do our best to make sure that we learn from earthquakes and we try to avoid this kind of situations. And ERI has been doing this for many years. Actually, the first president of ERI was Lydic Jacobson, a professor here in the mechanical engineering department at Stanford. And since then, this is, has been our mission. And, and in particular, uh, we're very proud. This is that my colleagues in the executive committee of LFE, we all work very hard, but we do very little of this. It's really many individuals that help us do this reconnaissance. And nowadays we, we are starting a new era in which we do this virtually. We do it hybridly, some virtually and some in the field. And this is a little bit about what we will be uh, presenting today. As, as Maggie said, uh, next year, we're gonna be celebrating the 50th anniversary. And I want to invite you all to be part of that, uh, not only of the celebration, but of course, to become a ERI member and a contributor to LFE. So with that, I'll just say a few words and put in context what happened uh, this year in Mexico. So this is briefly the, the tectonics, the plates that are involved in Mexico. Uh, as you see, there are those five plates. And in particular, the most interaction, the interface of the Cocos plate 
and the North American plate, that's what produces most of the earthquakes in Mexico. And uh, basically the Cocos plates, it's subducting uh, under the North American plate and produces reverse faulting earthquakes that when that reverse faulting involves very shallow angles, we call them thrust. And when they're very big, we call them mega thrusts earthquakes. Uh, all of what we're gonna be presenting today or most of it is contained in this report that as Maggie and Hector uh, mentioned, we put very fast after the earthquake, 30 different authors participated from five different countries and we produced this very nice 100 page report in about a week. You can find this report on our website, the LFE website. You don't need to remember any of these addresses, you just Google it. And the first one that I'm highlighting there is, is this one, uh, the, the Aquila. I had no idea that, that there was an Aquila in, in Mexico. You all know about the other Aquila earthquake, uh, but indeed the automatic naming of USGS, uh, name it like that in Mexico, we call it the Michoacan earthquake, which is the state where it occurred. And over there, you not only find this report, but another one that our sister organization, GEAR, uh, produced, uh, Geotechnical and Geotechnical Engineering Reconnaissance for uh, Extreme Events. And there's a third report by the University Michoacana de San Nicolás Hidalgo that uh, Professor Jorge Ruiz produced with his students. That's also available there. Uh, very briefly, to put in context the level of seismicity that we have in Mexico compared to the one of the US, and of course, US is very active, especially the subduction zone in Alaska. But if you leave that out, like the rest, the lower 48, and especially California, where we think that that it's, you know, we, we live in big country. I, I tell my student, you know, I sort of miss earthquakes. I mean, there are just no earthquakes in California compared to Mexico. And just to give you an idea of that, uh, if you look at magnitude between uh, earthquake magnitudes between six and seven, as you see this in this table, Whereas in the lower 48 in 100 years, you would have had 85 of those. In Mexico, it would be 264. So about four times the number of earthquakes. But it's the same thing on, on between seven and eight. It would be uh, 11 in the last 100 years in the lower 48, uh, where there's been um, uh, 46, as you see there in Mexico. And when it comes to the really big ones, the really destructive ones, larger than eight, uh, fortunately, we have not had that in, in the last 100 years uh, in, in the lower 48, but there's been four of those in, in Mexico. And uh, of those four, and, and just to put, we, we will talk more about this, but I think it played a particular important role, these two magnitude 8 earthquakes. One that I mentioned at the beginning of my participation, the September 19, 1985 magnitude 8, you know, everybody sort of remembers this big earthquake in Mexico that occurred uh, in, in the state of Michoacan and part of Guerrero. And, and that caused a lot of destruction, in particular uh, nearby the epicenter, a lot of destruction in residential construction. And then more recently in 1995, we suffer again another uh, uh, magnitude nine, uh, I mean eight, and again, a lot of destruction in residential construction. So I think this event that happened on September 19, 2022, occurred right in the middle. And uh, we saw, fortunately, less destruction that would have had. So we need to sort of understand and put in context this previous events in terms of the damage that will be described. And uh, the other thing that I would want to briefly uh, mention that many of you may or may not know is that Mexico, and especially Mexico City, has very interesting and unique uh, geotechnical characteristics, very soft clay deposits with water contents up to 400%, sure wave velocities uh, as low, and in some cases even lower than 70 meters per second, and plasticity indices that they're just like off scale. In, in clays, we talk about a plastic clay when it would have values in the order of 30, 40, 50, but these, some of these are 180. And that produces uh, very unique characteristics. The motions and the amplifications tend to be much, much larger than that. And just to put that in context, those of you here in the United States probably heard about Harry Bolton Seed, who I had the fortune to be a student of, and he would show this in class. Uh, well, his, his, his son, because unfortunately he didn't live to, to see this event, but he would always talk about the, the 
the effect of site conditions. And here in the Bay Area, we have sort of the poster child uh, example side by side, which is the island of Yerba Buena right in the middle of the Bay, which is a rock outcrop uh, right next to an artificial island, which is um, Treasure Island. And as you can see there, the recorded accelerations in the Loma Prieta earthquake were uh, close to a factor of three. And this is uh, another image of those couple of islands. Um, there you see the, the Bay Bridge. And, uh, and just comparing some of these spectral amplification, uh, it's not only the amplification on PGA, but on spectral ordinates uh, in the Bay Area. This is what we locally would call uh, Bay Mud. Uh, young Bay Mud can amplify you know, something like four or five times. Uh, in Mexico City, we've seen and we see sort of uh, very often amplifications of 11 or 12. And in this event, uh, there's a, a city in the state of Colima, uh, Ciudad Guzman, which suffers of similar effects. I had the opportunity to be there in 1985 and, and my advisor in Mexico told me, make sure you go there because uh, you will see a lot of, a lot of damage and, and that is gonna be uh, described. Uh, I'll just say another sort of interesting or unique aspect of this earthquake is that it occurred in September 1919, uh, in September 19. And this is the third event that we have had in only 37 events that there are major earthquakes producing collapse of engineer structures, as you see on the screen. So first we had the one that I mentioned first, the magnitude eight, 1985. Uh, but then just a few years ago, we had another one on September 19th. And you will hear about the early warning system that we have in Mexico. And thanks to that early warning system, we get warnings anywhere from 20 up to uh, more than two minutes of warning that, that allow people uh, to do lots of things. And they train the subway system and, and evacuate schools and many other things. And, uh, but despite of that, we have uh, lots of casualties. And yet again, on that day in which we have sort of the national drill, the shakeout, if you will, of Mexico. Uh, and that was in the morning of these two events. And a few hours after this national drills, the real thing happened. And uh, now there are all this, these memes going around and, and jokes saying, well, you know, it's like in 2017, it was, a few hours before and it got closer in 2022 and uh and maybe the next one they're gonna get it right and and have the drill at the same time as the, as the as the earthquake uh, so with that uh, i'll just stop there and pass it on to my colleagues great thank you eduardo next we'll hear from dr miguel jaimes who will provide details about the seismological aspects of the earthquake Dr. Jaimes is a professor and researcher in the structural en in structural engineering at the Institute of Engineering of the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Miguel? I will talk to you about the 9th, September 19, 2022 earthquake, but on the perspective of what was done here in this task force, a general view and a preliminary analysis. One thing that I am seeing here is that a magnitude of 7.6 is being managed. And we had heard that it was 7.7 .7 according to the National Seismologic Service. Well, why? Why do we issued, did we issue this report in 2017? Well, first of all, I would like to thank the Smiths and EERI, as well as Dr. Leonardo Ramirez Guzman for present, he, he was going to be, present this lecture. Unfortunately, he's sick. Hopefully he will recover soon. And I thank him for letting me present this lecture. I divided the, the talk in into six points. The objective, the introduction, um, seismicity, the characteristics of the source, the movement um, of the ground is tsunami and, and this part that we will see of the strong movement that is related to the damage. And finally, I will provide some conclusions. All of this, what I will present next, is found in this report that emerged after about a month of the earthquake. So perhaps some of the data 
is still not up to date or was not up to date at the time. And I wanted to keep it unchanged. So the idea is to present you what the report contains. You can download it uh, from this link and it includes all of the records that we had available at the time, as well as damage reports because of the size of uh, September 19, 2022, as Dr. Eduardo Miranda mentioned in this case, Perhaps there were some different events. I'm showing you the epicenters of the all of the seismics from 1900 to 2022. Uh, all of the seismics with magnitudes over six, and there's over 200. In this case, we have 128 um, that are the ones that we have recorded. And over here, we can see the event that occurred that Dr. Miranda explained to us about how seismic events occur in Mexico and, and in some other countries. So what are the peculiarities? Well, that this earthquake occur, as he explained it quite clearly, at 1 p.m., 13 hours, Mexico City uh, time. And it was almost an hour after the national drill um, from both in 1985 and 2017 that occurred exactly on the same day, of course, in different years, but with a difference of 37 or five years, respectively. Um, and this event occurs at almost um, 400 kilometers away from Mexico City, and the magnitude was 7.7. .7. Of course, we have to update the data as, as whether it was 7.7 .7 or 7.6. The, the seism had a, a, an inverse, a reverse failure mechanism at a depth of 15 kilometers. And as was mentioned, in, in very nearby places, nearby to the epicenter, it generated damage in about like 6,000 houses that had not been built with engineering, according to the Civil Protection Center, affecting 116 schools, 21 churches, and caused three deaths. So as I mentioned, the coincidence of these three events in happening in this same day is what is gathering us today. Why these, these seisms occur? Uh, so near from each other. This earthquake really um, caused commotion of all Mexicans, not only for their harmful damage, but also because of the psychosocial risks, stress, anxiety, and uh, concern. And if you ask people, you know, people that you know, and you have this idea that when it is September, when you think that there will be an earthquake. So on that same day, two researchers estimated the probability of having two or three seismic events. Dr. Mateos, for one, estimated that the probability of the occurrence of three events was of 0.000751%, whereas, or rather, Dr. Mario Ordaz estimated that the probability of observing two to three events was of 0.76 or and 0.016. We're talking here about significant events. So the probability is quite high if you pay attention to this. So this estimation is important because at certain point in time, we have thought whether it would be necessary to change the date because of the psychosocial risk the stress that an earthquake can cause on, on people that live in this case in, in Mexico City. And however, we think that this date is very significant because people have a living memory. Um, what makes it even more important to carry out the drills and be aware of the fact that earthquakes will continue to happen and that this is just normal. Now, the characteristics of the source, uh, the tsunami and the ground movement, ground motion. This is 
an earthquake that took place right um, in the coastline of Michoacan. This is Colima. And these are the two states where there was greater damage with a reverse mechanism. And in this zone, there's a dotted line here. This is the neo volcanic axis. And we will see that there are some effects um, with respect to other rock sites. Now, I'm showing you here the fault. This is a fault that was generated by Professor Mendoza. Let me see if I can do something. So this is the fault. And with a star, we mark the epicenter. And here we may see that there are two sliding areas, that one to the northwest and another one to the southwest. And another very important thing is that seismic movements to the southwest of the fault, amplitudes are lower with respect to what you could observe to the northeast or rather the north where you can see larger amplitudes. This is associated to an effect of direction. This is this will be shown later on with a simulation to review the hypothesis. So we had sliding slides of uh, with peaks of up to 1.3 meters. So to do this, a finite element simulation was uh, created by means of the Hercules tool. Here you see the horizontal velocities in different time points, one at 17 seconds and another one at 35 seconds, another one at 52 and another one at 87. You can see there the uh, star marking the epicenter. And please see here on this time moment of 52 seconds in a darker color, the velocity is higher. And in clear color, in light color, it is a lower velocity. So here you can see how it is changing and, and you see a greater phenomenon to the northwest versus the south or southeast. We will try and match this with the distribution of damages that were observed. A couple of minutes afterwards, the Engineering Institute produced some maps, in this case, maximum ground acceleration maps, as well as spectral accelerations associated to two seconds. So several maps were produced, estimating the intensities from mild to strong. And just a couple of minutes after, you can still have the seismic intensities. So here we see that the seismic intensities in red were greater than 150 centimeters. There's a station from the National Seismological Service that generated up to 9.2 centimeters per square second. So this tells us that the station was practically four kilometers away from the epicenter. So we have records or rather recordings of great major intensities. On the other hand, the National Sea Service reported waves in Manzanillo of 1.75 meters, uh, very close from here. This is Manzanillo and this is part of Acapulco. And so on this figure, what we see is the spatial distribution of the wave height generated by means of the tsunami development model that include the location, the fault plane. And these distributions seem to underestimate what the sea service reported 
but that starts to be coherent with what was reported by the Tsunami Alert Center of the Navy that reported abnormal changes of the sea level of up to 0.82 meters. So in here we have changes of up to 1.3 throughout the coastline. On the other hand, this is a map of intensities versus the prediction models that we have. And uh, we mainly selected, actually, we three prediction equations for ground movement, ground motion. And this is the one that is most used for estimating the seismic danger in Mexico, outside of Mexico City. This one of Arroyo Pues with a red line. The other one is that of Schalt, very much used as well. And the last one, which was published recently by Parker and others, in which uses the global level. This is represented in blue. So these are the distances in this case from 10 to up to 600 kilometers. In this figure, well, this is a compar comparison for maximum ground accelerations uh, for spectral tests of one second or two seconds. And here how some colors are the sites that are within Mexico City that as Dr. Miranda mentioned, present site effects. So these estimations, what you can observe is that the one in effect that of Dr. Arroyo is of up to 400, it's valid in for up to 400 kilometers and it is quite appropriate. Here you even see the percentile bands. And please remember that this is for a size of 7.7. .7. So it is appropriate. But conversely, for instance, for larger distances, it seems that the new prediction equation seems to be more appropriate. Remember that I told you that there was a zone of the neo-volcanic axis. Well, in, in these places, it is a known fact, and it's been known for more than 10 to 15 years that there are some regional amplification effects. This is why it well, it seems that this is due to the amplification that we see here, that the attenuation law is contemplated, not so this other one, but it seems to still be appropriate to continue using this one. Now, by contrary, if we do the same exercise for Mexico City, and this is special because Mexico City requires site effects, even in um, solid ground in Mexico City. It requires its own strong movement prediction equations. And in this case, it seems to be that there's, that the movement is being overestimated with respect to the movement predictions. But this one was considering an earthquake of 7.7, .7. maybe with one of six, 7.6, it can improve uh, or change and we could review it or revise it. Now this is, let's talk a little bit about the damage and a little bit about the systems. Now this slide shares with you intensities, in this case, the maximum ground acceleration or PGAs, peak ground acceleration, but also sites where there was information. This report took place in the month of October. And uh, that was the information available at the time. So one thing that I told you, when well, this is the epicenter, and I told you that there is an effect uh, pointing to the Northwest, which is marked by the damage pattern, and that there were lower intensities towards the Southeast to the North, perhaps there are some side effects that maybe have been generated, but at least we already have that. This is a part of the hypothesis to try and explain the damage occurrence. Also in Mexico City, there is a, an, an early warning system.
in this case, the um, National Autonomous University map. And we can see that these intensities are, in fact, lower than the ones that we will compare to those marked to a spectrum design. Also, these are the damage maps in the water distribution network. And also in this case, the system provides the number of victims, which in this case was zero for Mexico City and different numbers in, in elsewhere. And this allows us to make some decisions in just a few minutes. This is what I showed you. This is the spectrum used for reviewing the service limit state. That is, if the seismic intensities that occur do not surpass this, buildings will remain under linear behavior. And this is what we see here, but observe please that the intensities never exceeded both in the university city for the SCT, the Ministry of uh, Communications. This is where greatest uh, displacements were seen in 1985. Now, the Ministry of Communications and Transportation, SCT, uh, determined an acceleration of 90. So in this case, major structures should have been reviewed, but as there was no, ex uh, no excesses, it was not surpassed, well, no protocols were implemented. Now, in this case, the government of Mexico City reported mild and moderate damages in 20 to 21 constructions. These erections, some of them have been reviewed and they're the ones who, which had previous damages, be it in 1985 during the earthquake or even in 1985 and 2017, that is, these are structures that have already suffered damages. And in view of the seismic effect 2022, there were mild damages. So as conclusions, by way of conclusion, so the earthquake that occurred was almost 400 kilometers away. One of the greatest intensities took place uh, at almost 902 centimeters. And people believe that this is more likely that it will occur on September the 19th. And it is important to continue the drills on this date and to remember those who were the victims both in 1985 and 2017 and, and those deaths help further the drills. Now, on the other hand, the seismic intensity uh, prevention equations seem to be appropriate. We have to review them for the university city. Why? Because they were created maybe 11 or 12 percent, uh, 12 years, sorry. So we have to bring them up to date. So although with this new magnitude of 7.6, we are still within the value of uncertainty and they may be appropriate. And finally, just to remind you that seismic intensities did not exceed the design intensities, which are associated to the um, limit of service state or status. This is why the earthquake of 2017 was a good chance to review design for um, functional buildings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, next, we'll hear from Juan Manuel Espinosa about earthquake early warning. Engineer Espinosa is the founder and director general of CIDES, the Center for Seismic Instrumentation and Recording in Mexico. I think we're all set. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Well, Dr. Miranda and Dr. Jaime has already presented very complex uh, papers. We are in a region of very high or strong earthquakes and the local culture knows that our center exists 
from 1976. And the need was found to establish many centers within the metropolitan city. And in addition, to make sure that these centers would be all in operation, we developed electronics for the accelerometers for strong motions. And thanks to that, we have been able to extend coverage beyond Mexico City. And we will talk about um, the Mexican seismic alert seismic performance. This is the current coverage of the seismic zone where we have instruments, practically a hundred installed from Bahia de Banderas all the way to the Tehuantepeques must, it's a group of instruments that have a topology with repeaters. They have a very complex telecoms infrastructure that help collect and transmit the data of a certain earthquake in different places, all of the places that have been marked here on the graph. And all of these are populations that can get alerts in an early manner. Well, this is a map of historical performance from 1991, ever since we were working in the system, more than 30 years uh, in terms of seismic alerts. We have many small earthquakes between uh, around 27, between six and seven and 11 large magnitude earthquakes. This year we have measured seven, the yellow one, the, I mean, the red ones are the ones of September 19. We have many replicas that have been measured and detected on this region. And the two most important ones, the main earthquake and a replica from the 22nd of the month were basically the ones that triggered the alert. So the alert system is very robust. And uh, well, this is the history of the system in, in more than 30 years, we have managed to measure about 11,500 earthquakes and only 178, the more intense ones received alerts um, where they were between 3.5 and 8.2 at the Tehuantepec Isthmus. But these are the numbers coming from the system and it makes us feel at ease that the data have to be extended. This We produce this kind of electronics that we have on site in different uh, field stations. And the in 1986, we received um, numerous electronic spare parts to keep them in operation. We assemble and we test systems that are really leading edge. The, acceleration chart that we see from the north and the east obviously uh, show the arrival of the P wave and at three seconds there's a chance to determine a possible range to alert depending on the value that the estimator will give us we may describe and make an alert of the deep seisms we have some places of the Republic where there are seismic at more than 10 kilometers of depth. For instance, in Oaxaca, we just cannot expect to see the S and you can alert with this criterion of 13 points if the, uh, of three point seconds. If the S wave arrives before three seconds, you conclude that this is the S minus P and the original criterion to trigger the alert was for developed for earthquakes of the Guerrero coast. And you see some of them that are shallow, two times S minus B to have a determinator. This is reconciled with the station that may be found in different country parts of the country, depending on the number. And also depending on the distance to Mexico City, we determine whether federal alerts are necessary if the earthquake is above six or if it is above 5.5 on this band, we could also generate or trigger alerts. Or if there are earthquakes happening closer from the metropolitan area of Mexico City, well, uh, alerts should be triggered. 
and as you can see, all of these algorithms appear on the papers that I take the liberty to show. This is a bulletin of the Seismological Society of America. These are the criteria that were published in 2017-18, uh, and this is the most recent one. The system intends for people to have time to be able to react if, if it is a, an earthquake. And we have an automatic system that allows uh, us to impact the population. We have commercial stations, TV, radio, AM and FM, and some experimental early warning seismic receivers from 1993. So automatic um, alerts are because the system takes control. Um, and if it is an alert that is uh, of the appropriate level, well, the audible alert will be heard. We are reaching the audience of a commercial radio from 19... 93 already before we already had the subway of Mexico City, the metro system. In order to protect travelers um, traveling on the on their way or, or the subway system. Then there we also have kindergartens and elementary, middle and high public schools. The parents gave us permissions to permission to conduct alert experiments in the school setting. Of course, the service has become expanded to different spheres, including uh, the emergency and protection agencies. Now, in the case of civil servants, we have public buildings. And more recently, with support of the local metropolitan area, loudspeakers were incorporated. These are a tool, although people may not have a radio handy or any other device, people may learn about the situation through the loudspeakers. We also have a recent development, which is the public alert radios that have been fine-tuned with a special code to acknowledge um, alerts from 2008. And we have had support from the local government and even the federal government so that these radios could be brought to Mexico. We brought a large number of radios, of course, not as many as we would need, but it is almost 100,000. And here we have the public power loudspeakers from 2015, the local government allowed the dissemination of these loudspeakers and then the cell broadcast and the um, communications, telecommunications of author authority of the country allowed us to have a cell cellular phone broadcast. The new phones that will be sold in Mexico City will include um, an alert system. This is under development and all of this needs to happen so that most of the population will be given as much time as possible to react. This is considered to be very useful. The mobile telephony technology is complex and it, um, the, the calls are per subscriber. So this increases the success um, of an alert system. In the next slide, we have a place in Mexico where we already have coverage of the different region. This is the metropolitan zone of Mexico in the port of Guerrero and the capital city in Oaxaca as well. Here is Morelia. We have transmitters with a coverage and an amount of um, a population that is quite large. And as you can see on the graph, you see the 
the photograph of it, we have almost 90,000 of them so that people will learn automatically of any alert. This is quite advanced. It has been used to broadcast information about 80 calamities almost. And in Mexico, uh, well, there's many institutions in Mexico that are experiencing high risk phenomena and that can be communicated by means of this receiver that can also be used to predict earthquakes. So this is the headway made in almost 30 years of development. And here I would like to show you the film, a video clip of September the 15th, There you see the exact moment in Michoacan, messages start to be triggered. These are the P and the S waves propagating. This is already a state that require or that deserves an alert and you see practically that the alert is issued here on top you can see the messages Messages are being received from radios that are in the different stations being stimulated by the seismic wave. And towards the end, we have north, south, east, west accelerations, a maximum acceleration. And this is what is being received at the National Seismic Center. And so determinations can start to be carried out within the university. With respect to the time of origin and other facts. This is a tool that is available all of the time and that triggers messages. So it's, it's, it's interesting on this graph to see the, the moments when there's recordings in Michoacan, they determine to alert through the blue line and upon alerting, we have some of the oscillation measurements in Morelia. This is another um, neighboring city. Mexico City had approximately 110 seconds before the arrival of the wave of early warning. So this is a, an interesting chance. And in fact, shortly ago, we had um, in Colima peak ground acceleration of 160 in the east, west, and south, north. We measured uh, more than two peak to peak. We're practically at the epicenter. And this is a very interesting thing to be able to install this kind of system. This is in order to alert the population as support for the authority. 
when we were able to send a complementary report. This is a map that we could make available to you if you just send us a message by email, not, not through WhatsApp, but rather send us a telegram. You can enroll, send us your name, and we can um, include you. Mexico City, yeah, in Mexico City, the, the alert may be sounding um, simultaneously with the seismic, and we, we can detect the distance depending on the on the time. We can have quite characteristic parameters, the velocity of P, the velocity of wave S, and to know when it is going to arrive, this multiple color bar is showing us the intensity of the local hubs that have triggered the alert. So this appears automatically in mobile phones so that the people in charge of civil protection services can have an idea of why the alert is sounding and how long would they have to react. The bulletin that appears here is issued by email to various users and it also provides information on why the alert is sounding. Here we can see when the alert is triggered in the different cities and, and more or less the warning time. So this is an initial tool. Once the seismic effect is over in Mexico City, this other bulletin is issued where the PGAs that are captured by all of the instruments shown on this map can also be known by people having the automatic message. At your far right-hand side, we ha you have a column of the accelerations that were recorded and the sites that measured and how long did it last um, ab above a certain acceleration level. This is a report that will be produced once the recording is over. This is the time during which the seismic effect um, lasted. And it provides very deep understanding to the National Institute of Construction. This is our historical sponsor. And this way they can learn and assess the structural damage they might anticipate. In the lower most right hand side portion of the slide, you have the maximum accelerations, the cities that have a record or a, a, a recording of harsh move, move motion. Now, Communication is also sent via Twitter. And all of these are papers that are sponsored um, by the General Secretary uh, of Risk Protection and Civil Protection. All of this happens with certain high pace. This is the summary and we're getting um, basically to the end of it, you detect a, an earthquake and the first earthquake recognizes, it's recognized as a pre-alert. There's a nearby station that confirms that it is a dangerous earthquake. The map that we have seen triggers the other map or the clip, the video clip that we saw and you see the, the computer that automatically measured when the alert notice is triggered, uh, radio broadcasters and uh, um, loudspeakers start operating and warning 
people that there is danger and that they have to act with prevention for prevention purposes. This is a big challenge because you should not always protect yourself uh, for an earthquake, depending on where you're at, if you're in a city or um, a house. And uh, of course, also the quality of materials makes a difference. And so the loudspeaker started to operate and we have bulletins of about uh, 15 seconds. And after 15 seconds, we are issuing WhatsApp messages as appear here in the chart, also in uh, the telegram and, and you start the telecontrol commands uh, are, are put in operation. There's almost 90 accelerometers in operation. And in terms of the buildings, we have also buildings that are being reviewed automatically to detect their structural health. Everything is, um, we started um, and uh, information is at the um, website. We have no operators, everything is automatic. And then we see the PGAs and the final report decision where you can see all of the stations of the system that could detect the phenomenon. This time of 1.6, This time allows us to know that the seismic phenomenon already crossed the urban city. So this is a tool. And of course, the summary is quite short, but this is just to let you know how it works. And I had to summarize in the interest of time. But if you have any questions, of course, I will be happy during the Q&A session to respond. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation. Thank you very much, Juan Manuel. Next, we'll hear from Juan Mayoral and Kevin Clayhan on the geotechnical impacts of the earthquake. Kevin is a principal geologist at Lettuce Consultants International and an expert in the fields of engineering geology, seismic hazard, and slope stability. Juan is a civil and, earth, uh, civil and geotechnical earthquake engineer and a research professor at the Institute of Engineering of the National Autonomous University of Mexico, where he is the head of the Advanced Numerical Modeling and Instrumentation Group. Kevin and Juan were part of the GEAR UNAM team that conducted reconnaissance after the earthquake. Kevin? Okay, thank you. All right, uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be a part of this event. I'm Kevin Clahan, and uh, I'm an engineering geologist, and I'll be speaking about our field reconnaissance of the September 19th, 2022 earthquake from a mostly geological standpoint. Uh, I hope that my talk will help to set up my colleague, Professor Mayoral, for his subsequent geotechnical presentation of observation. So our field reconnaissance was supported by GEAR, as was mentioned previously uh, by Professor Miranda. Um, it was under the direction of Professor Jonathan Stewart, and we were also supported by Professor Mayoral and Yuna. Uh, Danielle De La Rosa and Mauricio Perez and I performed the reconnaissance. So just again, a, a summary, we've heard uh, some more of these regional discussions. Uh, this is also a more, a little bit more uh, zoomed in uh, map that Professor Miranda uh, showed us briefly earlier. It was an interface subduction earthquake of magnitude 7.7 .7 or 7.6 occurring on September 19th uh, along the Middle America Trench mega thrust near the central Pacific coast of Mexico in the state of Michoacan. Uh, on the map on the right here, we see the various uh, rupture planes going back to 1973. And it appeared the September 19th, 2022 earthquake appears to have ruptured a portion of the plate boundary that last ruptured in 1973 in a magnitude 7.6 event. And this tells us that approximately 50 years have gone by 
uh, between the earthquakes, that's enough time for, for the fault to reaccumulate significant stress. The 2022 rupture plane also coincides in part with the 1985 Mexico City earthquake and 1986 aftershock, suggesting that the 1985 fault rupture is also accumulating stress. I want to point out too this uh, three days later on September 22nd, there was a 6.9 aftershock that occurred just to the south uh, of the main shaft. So our field reconnaissance uh, happened on September 28th, 29th, and 30th, uh, about 10 days after the earthquake, a little less than 10 days when we started. We started in Puerto Vallarta and drove south along Federal Highway 200 uh, down through Correas and Manzanillo and Tecoman, uh, where we spent the night. We then went down uh, all along the coast to near the epicenter to the uh, little coastal town of Marwata. And then we headed back up, up into Colima, uh, Ciudad de Guzman, and then we concluded in Guadalajara. You can see here that uh, there's numbered locations. And so each location contains an observation uh, that we made in the field. And whether that was a landslide, a damaged building, or whatnot, you can see that the concentration of, of uh, observations increased dramatically as we got within about 80 kilometers of the episode. So again, being a geologist, uh, I was looking to see if different types of rock behave differently um, during the earthquake. As we left Puerto Vallarta, we were driving through uh, intrusive igneous rocks that were comprised of granites and granodiorites primarily. Uh, the central part of the of Colima state is underlined by the Mexican volcanic belt where the active Nevada de Colima and Colima volcanoes are located um, just above the, the town of Colima. And then the epicentral area uh, also is underlain by volcanics as well as shallow marine limestone and shale deposits. And so we are looking to see how the geology affected uh, damage and ground shaking effects. So looking at landslide hazard, uh, landsliding along the route consisted primarily of shallow rock slides and rock falls of bedrock material in road cuts adjacent to the federal highways along the entire reconnaissance route and in nearly every geologic unit. Some long run out debris flat slides or debris flows were noted originating on near vertical slopes and traveling for hundreds of kilometers or hundreds of meters. The landslides we encountered typically varied in size based on location and were estimated to be between 30 to 3,000, over 3,000 cubic meters in volume. This uh, images here are showing landsliding and weathered granite that we encountered in a road cut near Ocono up in Jalisco, north of the epicenter. Uh, rock slides and rock falls also originated in both natural and cut slopes adjacent to the federal highway. Uh, these images here are, uh, were photographed by a UAV uh, near Las Brisas in Michoacan, and they did not appear to be reactivations of earlier failures, but rather new slides. Uh, there's a small image here of, of Daniel preparing uh, the drone for flight. I want to also uh, give a shout out to the uh, Mexico Department of Transportation. They did an excellent job of removing landslide debris from the roads. And we couldn't have done our reconnaissance without it. However, they were so efficient that we also couldn't get a good handle on volumes as well, uh, because they'd done, done such a good job of cleaning the roads, even within one week of the earthquake. Liqu liquefaction uh, was relatively widespread, again, within about 80 kilometers of the epicenter. It was manifest in loose, uh, saturated Holocene sand deposits. And it occurred in towns uh, near La Zaporatera, El Tipis, Extapia, and Marawata in Polima and Michoacan states. Liquefaction uh, was observed as lateral spreading features, as well as sand boils and also sand blows along open fissures. So these two images uh, near El Tipis in Michoacan show lateral spreading in beach sands uh, along a back, back beach area near the coast. Again, these are loose, unsat or saturated sands. One of the larger lateral spread features that we saw occurred near La Zapotera in Colima. 
Um, you can see there's a nearby bridge. We did note damage to the bridge, but it was likely from foundation settlement and not this lateral spread. The next image sort of shows a little uh, overhead map of this lateral spread feature. Uh, this is taken from the uh, UAV. And the red hash marks note the fractures and the limits of lateral displacement over the effective area. Uh, it extends, it occurred in a natural river levee and the amount of vertical displacement was on the order of about two meters. And it was spread over about uh, 30 to 40 meter long and wide area. Also evidence for liquefaction, we see sand boils or sand volcanoes. They were observed in a riverbed near Extapia, Michoacan. Uh, the sand was ejected from points along a linear natural levee and, and it buried nearby vegetation. Uh, therefore, we could tell it was recent. Uh, there were over a dozen sand boils total, all with similar volumes of ejecta, approximately one cubic meter. Uh, fissures were evident near the sand boils, but no ejecta from the fissures was observed. Uh, evidence of liquefaction is all usually the first uh, earthquake um, property that is erased by, by rain or by uh, cleanup uh, efforts. And so it's always important for us to document these liquefaction features. And it shows how some of the uh, coastal areas uh, responded to the earthquake. This is another uh, area. This is near Marawata in Michoacan, near the epicenter. <clears throat> And uh, we observed here, not sand boils perhaps, but sand blows along fissures. And so sand ejecta was noted as having flowed from several of the fissures and locals that we spoke to reported sand ejecta spouting as high as one to two meters and continuing to spout well beyond the duration of earthquake shaking. And in some, in these photos here, you can see the fissures and then you can see the lighter colored sands that sort of rim each of these each of these fissures here. This is the sand that's been ejected from those fissures. And I'm just gonna go briefly into a couple of uh, evidences of some of the structural damage that we encountered. I'm gonna let Professor Meyer out talk in more detail, uh, but in uh, Koayana in Michoacan, we saw uh, a total collapse of a two-story house with a soft first floor. There was actually a truck that was crushed underneath this particular house when it failed. Uh, other evidence of earthquake shaking damage, you see these diagonal cracking and unreinforced masonry buildings. This was a common uh, occurrence that we saw in many areas throughout our, our reconnaissance. Uh, there was lateral failures of federal highways. This is near Koloa in Michoacan. Uh, you can see us measuring uh, this area here. Um, there was in general, uh, pretty good behavior of the road. Some of the bridges, however, along the way were displaced. Uh, we see lateral displacements of some of the decks and damage in the pier caps of bridges uh, that you can see here. This is a pretty typical type of failure that Professor Meyer and I will discuss in more detail. Uh, I, and so I, I just want to pass along. We did, uh, it was mentioned before, at the, we did produce a gear report, uh, report 078. And uh, this is a picture of the reconnaissance team. Uh, and uh, I encourage everyone to go and read. There's much more details and photographs from the reconnaissance in this particular report. So I'll stop sharing my screen and, and pass it along uh, to Professor Mayo. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I, first of all, I, I'd like to thank the organizing committee, and uh, in particular, my friend Hector Guerrero for inviting me to share our findings and uh, observations that we gathered during this reconnaissance. Um, everything started on September 19, as was already mentioned. We were in the middle of, um, uh, of our annual meeting to remember the September 19 earthquakes. And uh, my friend John Stewart was about to give a, a talk about the, this new uh, attenuation relationship that was mentioned uh, before. Uh, we had been working on this, adding some data from the subduction Latin America database and uh, the earthquake. 
so since we are engineers, the first thing that we did was to see how the model was predicting the actual response in firm soils. As you can see here, the, the blue line is the model and the, the, the NGA model that we have been working on. Uh, and uh, the gray line um, uh, are the, uh, record, the, the recordings in, in rock. And as you can see, the model is doing a, a, really, a really good job uh, in predicting the ground motions at uh, rock sites. Um, another important thing that we can notice in this plot and uh, that I want to stress out uh, is that we um, have side, um, side effects, as was mentioned before, in Mexico City, uh, in the late zone on the order of, uh, of, of 10, uh, an amplification on the order of 10 between the ground motion that was recorded in rock and the one ground motion that was recorded in the late zone. And uh, there was also an amplification in transition zone. And even in the hill zone, in some areas where we have uh, some sediments and uh, stiff soil, we, we uh, usually have amplification as well. So uh, these points right here uh, correspond to uh, sites in Mexico City. And uh, we can see that, uh, as was mentioned before, there was uh, side effects. And this is because Mexico City, uh, for you that uh, are not familiar with the, the geotechnical zoning of Mexico City. Mexico City was built on two former lakes, the Texcoco, the Texcoco Lake and the Xochimilco Chalco Lake. And uh, the seismic waves amplify drastically in, in the lake zone because of the reasons that uh, were already explained by Professor Miranda, the particularities of this clay, the high plasticity index, and the small amount of damping that is, uh, that is uh, um, presented uh, for even for so um, here uh, the damage is obviously associated with uh, the the uh, the period of the structure and the period of soil here for the 1985 earthquake the damage was focused on the lake zone and for the 2017 event the damage was focused on the transition area the transition area is around the lake and. Uh, uh, after the transition, we have what we call the hills, the hills uh, of the city. Um, after that, uh, uh, I was invited by um, my friend Eduardo Miranda to be part of the, uh, the preliminary virtual reconnaissance report, and also by my friend Leonardo Ramirez at the university, uh, that uh, he was in charge of issuing the official report from the from the university, from the National University of Mexico. And at that point, we were wondering if it is, was uh, uh, worth it to send some people to the, to, the, to the field because at the same time was happening another earthquake uh, in, in the world, the Taiwan earthquake. So I was uh, talking to John about sending some, some people there. And uh, one thing happened. We run it into this video uh, in the social uh, networks. That was a, a beach that presented um, lateral spreading associated to liquefaction and uh, and then since uh, John and I are uh, geotechnical oriented people uh, we decided that it was going to be very interesting to verify if, if this um, lateral spray and liquefaction was related to a couple effect of the ground shaking uh, and uh, the tsunami effect so and uh, the other reason why we we decided to go to the site was because uh, we were lucky. Uh, Kevin was uh, having some some uh, good time in Puerto Vallarta, and uh, since uh, he was already there, we decided to send some uh, more people from the university and had our gear team uh, ready to go from Puerto Vallarta all the way down to the epicenter, and then go all the way up. Then I think I think there is uh, okay. Then the ne the next step we put all that. That uh, was to put all the all the um, observations and findings uh, in a, in a report, as the one that that was already mentioned by by uh, Kevin the, the, or give report. So I would recommend you to to take a look at it. Uh, the the overview of this report uh, is presented in this slide. We are uh, separating the, the the observation in side effects, soil structure interaction, and liquefaction for side. 
effects, well, we, we need to remember that it was a 7.7 .7 magnitude earthquake that led to a very uh, high values of peak ground accelerations near the uh, epicentral area. We, as was already mentioned, we have a 0.9 G value uh, of uh, peak ground acceleration uh, near the epicenter. And uh, so uh, uh, the structures were subjective to this very high level of shaking. And uh, keep that in mind. Uh, now that I'm gonna show you some of the photos. This is the acceleration time history for that particular record. As you can see here, we have very large, large amplification for the spectral accelerations, as well as large peak ground acceleration. So side response effects were observed combined with um, topographical effects um, that led to the, to the um, uh, collapse of several, several slides that uh, this, this uh, coupling between topographical and uh, side response effects was already studied in the past by other researchers. In particular, we observed this in Mexico City during the 2017 earthquake, where we have a uh, coupling between the amplification that is caused in the sediments uh, due to side response, plus the DFX of uh, topographical amplification that leads to the um, slope stability failure. So uh, we saw that uh, along the road, uh, Kevin, as, uh, as already explained, Kevin, Daniel, and Ma Mauricio were driving around and they were looking at these uh, stop stability failures uh, in which we have this uh, very interesting uh, phenomena where we have these coupling effects. We also have traditional slope stability failures where there was a, a low factor of safety for uh, the sustained loading, um, static conditions basically, and then the, the ground sh shaking came and led to this uh, low stability failure. Cracking in roads was, uh, was also documented. This is very important because uh, uh, fragility curves for um, road infrastructure should be calibrated in order to make sure that we can predict when we're gonna have some uh, closure in, in in one of these roads uh, that uh, um, that uh, stop the mobility from one big city to an area where we can have uh, a situation to attend. Then uh, regarding soil structure interaction, uh, this, uh, this was already mentioned, I think, by other, other presenters. There was a, a damage in new structures, such as this one. Uh, this is uh, a structure in, in Manzanillo, I believe. And, uh, there was a, a incoherent movement between uh, uh, this part of the structure that is basically uh, reinforced concrete and uh, this more flexible one that is uh, essentially a, a, a steel structure. Um, so uh, this uh, uh, typically is associated with uh, um, rotation of the foundation. The reconnaissance, reconnaissance team went there, but they, they were not able to verify what was the foundation type of this structure, but more likely was uh, some kind of incoherence between both uh, bodies of, uh, of the mole uh, and uh, so, uh, some so typical soil structure interaction problem. Top stories were also observed along the structural reconnaissance. Uh, this uh, was very similar to those observed uh, in Mexico City uh, in several other events. Uh, in which we have uh, this uh, very soft uh, first uh, floor. Uh, we also observe damage in this hospital. This is interesting, an interesting thing because this was very located very close to the epicenter and considering the level of shaking, uh, there was a, a, um, a lot of solid structure interaction going on here that led to the, to the failure of this uh, new structure. Um, so uh, something interesting to point out here in this uh, in these uh, uh, bridges is that the peak ground acceleration was very large, as I mentioned before, and the damage was observed in the apartment, in the apartment of the bridge. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, the apartment uh, helped to maintain the structure in place by uh, undergoing um, a very large uh, uh, plastic deformation that was already observed in 2017 in Mexico City, in which the apartment helps to uh, 
um, reduce the, 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 to improve the performance of the, of the bridge by reducing the amount of energy that received the, the, the deck. And um, uh, then later you can repair the bridge and uh, have it um, more quickly operating. We saw also of this, uh, a lot of these um, lateral displacements in, uh, in upper decks, which was already mentioned by Kevin. And then I just would like Eduardo to turn the, the presentation to my uh, colleague, Daniel. Hi, everyone. I will talk about some liquefaction problems that, that we found in our reconnaissance. Here, as Kevin mentioned, we, we found a failure of natural levy due to lateral spreading in La Zapotera, Michoacán. The lateral extent, I will put this video. The lateral extent of the affected area is shown here, um, in, in which this one, let me, in which these marks uh, shows the lateral dis displacement. This lateral displacement created an, an open gap uh, near the head of the failure that had a lateral displacement of about 67 centimeters and a vertical displacement of around 16 centimeters. We, we checked and this cumulative lateral displacement uh, didn't affect the stability of, of this bridge. Also, um, the liquefaction was presented near the coast in beach sands along riverbeds and natural levees. Natural spreading occurred at sites which a natural slope or nearby free face. Uh, social media video was posted immediately the, the earthquake in Coahuayana, Michoacán, about 15 kilometers northwest to, to the epicenter where a beach had been shattered into numerous elongated fractures and fissures, scratching several hundred meters parallel to the, to the coast. This feature was interpreted as caused by lateral spreading of the, of the beach ants. We used an unnamed aerial vehicle to look along the stretch of the beach where the failure occurred, but these perishable features had been eroded by the incoming tides and waves prior to our visit. Also, we, we observed sand blows along fissures uh, in Marata, Michoacán. These fissures covered an area approximately of 200 square meters and were on the order of five to 10 meters long with lateral displacement of five to 15 centimeters. Also, we, we detect the sand boils, very similar to the observed damage in the 1999 earthquake of, in Tehuacan. Okay, so the conclusions of, of our reconnaissance, uh, we, we observed a large PGA near to the epicenter. SSI effects cause also damage in relative new structures. The bridge performance was satisfactory considering the level of shaking near the epicenter. Abutment cracking helped to reduce the seismic demand of, the, of, the, of these breaches. We observed couple site response topographic effects lead to a lot of slope failures along the roads. Large PGA and nearby water bodies led to liquefaction of non-plastic, saturated polygraded, and loose silty sands. And we observed a number of liquefaction cases along with sand boils and lateral spreading near to the to the epicenter thank you to everyone thank you all now we'll hear from sergio alcocer about structural engineering impacts from the earthquake sergio is reach a research professor at the institute of engineering of the national autonomous university of mexico and the former undersecretary for north america in the ministry of foreign affairs of mexico sergio Thank you very much, Maggie, um, and good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start by thanking ERI, uh, Professor Eduardo Miranda, and also uh, thanking the Mexican Society of Earthquake Engineering, Professor Hector Guerrero, for inviting me to talk about the structural damage. And I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, Professor Chavez Sanchez Alejandro Alarcón and Professor Guerrero, who provided me with information that I will present to you. I will start by presenting the lessons, and I'm starting with this because I know that time is, is very short. So I want to just highlight that the structures perform adequately, particularly those that had a proper layout, a proper detailing, 
good quality of construction and that were very well maintained. That was the case of buildings, for example, that complied with recent codes and they, they rendered to be undamaged. Uh, however, there were things that we learned, of course. And uh, one of the things that we learned is that we need to standardize a method for a post seismic evaluation. This is something that we have improved, uh, particularly for school buildings that we can use as a basis for extending, extending it for different types of construction. Also, we, need, we, need, uh, we learned that we need to have an evaluation and rehabilitation design standard. We are developing that for Mexico City based on the one that was developed uh, for the school buildings. And I think this will be a very interesting document, not only for the buildings that need to be repaired right, right after this earthquake, but for future events and also to uh, rehabilitate buildings before they are damaged in a preventive fashion. So these are some of the, of the uh, documents that had been developed that can be used as a basis for what I already mentioned, and they can be downloaded in, in, this, uh, uh, in this website. Uh, some other lessons that we learned is that certainly we need to improve training and professional development of our colleagues in different parts of, of the country. This is particularly the case uh, along the, the Pacific coast where most of our colleagues are not aware of what's going on in the developments uh, of, uh, of the design standards in, in Mexico City. Uh, we need it uh, to pay more attention in non-structural elements and, and content. Professor Miranda mentioned about the importance of non-structural components, and I will show you some of the slides that highlight why it was important to do that, uh, to, to do that, and actually to learn why what, what happened to this earthquake. Uh, one thing that we have learned over and over is that maintenance is an issue, a critical issue in buildings and infrastructure in Mexico. We don't pay enough attention uh, to maintenance. Uh, sometimes the behavior is actually controlled by the lack of maintenance of, of the structural elements. Uh, we have seen in many other earthquakes that non-engineering construction doesn't perform as well as engineering construction. This is a cultural issue and this is not an easy thing to remove, but certainly we need to incentivize engineering construction through technical aid to owners, uh, particularly this is for houses. Um, in order of, uh, uh, related to construction, construction impact inspections and quality control of materials are simply one of those issues that we need to work more closely with the construction industry. In many cases, construction industry is based on uh, the lowest cost uh, available or provided by for an infrastructure uh, a work or for a building, and we need to pay more attention into the quality control of these. And uh, we also need to implement public policies and regulations, particularly if we want to increase uh, community resilience. Um, this is, uh, of course, an everyday issue, and not only in, in, in these uh, parts of the country, but I will say uh, throughout the country in general, that we need to have updated and uh, it's critical to enforce uh, our codes. And certainly now with the, the functional recovery limit state or performance objective, uh, I think that has to be implemented for essential buildings. And certainly one thing that we need to learn from this earthquake is that we need to compare the behavior of the structures that were rehabilitated after the 1999 and 2003 events that occurred in Colima and uh, the, but compared to the, to the behavior of those uh, structures in this uh, earthquake. And I'll show you one slide at least that shows at least a, a good behavior. Uh, in the state of Colima, which is one of the states that were much more heavily damaged, these are some of the figures uh, related to the damage. Over 6,000 houses, you could see the number of school buildings, whether public or private, that were uh, rendered to be unsafe, or that were, that were yellow tagged or red tagged, uh, hospitals, commercial buildings, churches with minor damage, but there were 33 of them. And uh, I will say that um, compared to the size of the earthquake, damage you know, was not as severe as we would have um, expected. Uh, this is the type of, of damage that was recorded from non-structural elements and components. For example, uh, the, the, the fracture of, of window glasses or, or the distortion, uh, important distortion of some bookcases that were not properly uh, designed for uh, earthquake type uh, uh, loading. These are some photos on the, on the failure of ceiling panels uh, in, uh, in a college or on the, on the left-hand side on a university, on the right-hand side in, in a church. Uh, the structural uh, aspect or structural behavior was, uh, was adequate, but not the non-structural components. This is one of those cases in which the non-structural damage was credited to some torsion in the, in the structure. And uh, although this structure was properly constructed, you could see both concrete walls on both sides of the, of the door, 
uh, there were some torsion that induced large distortions and last large drift that eventually led to the failures that you could see there. Uh, this is one of those lessons that is hard to, to, to understand still uh, because we have had over and over in 1999, 2003, damages in hospitals. Well, again, we had damage in hospitals. This is the case of a one-story structure that you could see on the left-hand side that suffered non-structural damage, but that rendered that structure not to be used uh, right after the earthquake. And this is something that is critical, of course, for an emergency uh, uh, response. Uh, this is another a photo from another hospital in Tecoman, Colima, that also suffered damage in non-structural components. This is the case of ornaments and facades that are very beautiful, but uh, they are useless when they got uh, damaged, and particularly because they affect the behavior and the performance and the, the functionality of the structure. Uh, one thing that was curious for us is uh, some of the spalling of, of structures in which there is no um, in, uh, engineering uh, put into the, 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 the actual construction of the, of the mortar covering some of these structures. And because of the shaking, this mortar came, came down. There was no, 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 no damage to people, but uh, there was a significant uh, debris that, that occurred. This is one of those cases that I mentioned before of a structure that was rehabilitated uh, probably in 1999 with uh, steel jacketing made of steel angles and steel straps that you can see on the left-hand side. Well, the stucco or the, the, the mortar cover came down through the earthquake and uh, exposed the, the reinforcement. It's interesting to see that the column uh, seems to be in a good uh, condition with some cracking here and there, but structure is quite uh, safe and uh, it had to be repaired, the, the cover mortar. But this is one of those successful cases that we need to sort of record so that we know that uh, this type of, of, of rehabilitation scheme actually works. Uh, this is a, st a structure that has been presented before. Unfortunately, this is one of those structures that caused well, the death of, of one person that was standing uh, in, in next to the, to the structure. Uh, and this is something that we have observed in other cases. Uh, this is an out of plane failure of non-structural infills that are not connected, of course, to the structure, but they are not uh, properly designed for out of plane failures. The, 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 either they are not properly tie down to the beams or the floor system. They don't have proper uh, bracing uh, for out of plane failures. And for short term, for short uh, size structures in which you have a large demand for these type of, of uh, uh, elements is uh, quite typical that we have observed this uh, type of out of plane failure. So this is one of those issues that we have to learn and implement in new codes uh, so that we don't have more failures uh, like this. This is another example, exactly the very same one. But with one very interesting issue here is that this structure had been rehabilitated in 1995 and they provided some restrainers. You can see on the left-hand side, the steel plates uh, at the top of the columns that were provided to avoid the aeroplane failure towards the outside, but they didn't provide the very same plates inside. So the, the collapse of this uh, a, a wall occurred to the inside of the structure. Uh, fortunately, no one was there and nothing, nothing happened. As you can see this, the plates that I was mentioning. Uh, something that we have observed, particularly in school buildings, is the failure, the autoplane failure of boundary walls. This is one of those cases that uh, also occurred the we the bracing, the autoplane failure, the autoplane uh, bracing is quite limited. In uh, some cases, because of, of these uh, boundary walls, uh, built next to gardens and they are properly watered, that uh, eventually uh, creates corrosion in the vertical reinforcement of the, of the concrete elements that confine the masonry. And eventually that corrosion uh, reduces the, 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 the available transfer area of the bars and eventually you can see these type of collapses. As I mentioned before, uh, a lack of maintenance is, is, uh, is apparent in this type of earthquake. You can see whether they are on slabs or in columns. Uh, they it, it just uh, uh, spalling occurs is not so bad. It's, but in some cases, uh, because of the reduction in the size of bars, you could uh, tell that in some cases, the, the, the stability of the, of the slab, for example, could be compromised. You could see this picture in the, in the middle of the, of the slide that uh, the reinforcement is just lacking in some, in some uh, places because of the large corrosion that had occurred in this particular slab. 
Related to uh, non-engineered construction, uh, this is where most of the damage occurred in, in houses. This is where houses that were not uh, properly uh, constructed with the materials that you would expect that would have a proper or adequate performance, like for example, unreinforced masonry or adobe, and in some cases with a combination of timber, whether timber is used for the roof system or is used for confinement. Uh, these are photos in, in Michoacán, the state next to Colima, uh, in which some damage occurred in adobe, in adobe schools. Um, this, is, uh, a, this is still is, uh, we still have some school buildings, old school buildings that were built with adobe and they were built in rural areas. Uh, this is certainly not, not built anymore, but we still have some of them. Uh, this is a typical damage that we have observed many, many times in school buildings, short column effects. Uh, because of wall parapets that have been built against uh, the columns. In some cases, old buildings like these had very large spacing of the transfer reinforcement that eventually facilitates the behavior in control by shear, as that we all know is a brittle type of failure that eventually could cause the collapse of the structure. And in, in, in related to load bearing walls, we, as you know, in Mexico, we use a lot of masonry for our houses, for our school buildings, for hospitals. Uh, this is the case of a school building that had inclined cracking in the walls. Uh, and this, uh, the, the severity of this cracking is mainly controlled by the, by, by the existence or not of confinement elements. And in this case, uh, there might not be some confinement elements around the windows and door openings, and that will create much larger uh, cracking. Uh, in some cases, we observed damage due to torsion. I already mentioned one case. This is another case that uh, occurred uh, in Colima, in the, the, the capital city of the state of Colima, in which uh, there were uh, significant uh, cracking in infill walls because of the, of the torsional distortions and, and drifts uh, because of the, of the layout of, of the structure. There are some photos here of the cracking on infill walls. Uh, and infill walls were also cracked, not only because of torsion, but in other cases. As it was mentioned before, we observed also a damage in ground stories, uh, particularly in columns that were not properly detailed for, for ductile behavior. Uh, the right-hand side is a structure that was in, not in function, but you could see the very poor detailing. Actually, there is no detailing whatsoever. Uh, the concrete is all shattered and destroyed. Uh, there is a, a buckling of the reinforcement. Uh, there is a, a tremendous crushing. Of course, this is a structure that needs to be demolished eventually. And, uh, but uh, unfortunately, in some of these cases, is we're going back to the non-engineered construction. I wouldn't be surprised that this structure had been built by uh, the help of a local mason without a proper intervention of engineers and whatsoever. Uh, this is my final slides that have to do with the, some of the damage that were, that occurred in some uh, bridges in Michoacan on the left, left hand side, in Colima on the right hand side, abundance um, the seismic restrainers. We had already suffered damage in seismic restrainers in the 99 earthquake, and this is one of those opportunities to learn whether the, the, the repair that was uh, made uh, on those uh, structures actually uh, performed well. It looks like it did with little damage here, and, but we need to learn whether that, uh, those uh, rehabilitation techniques actually worked or not. And this is one of those cases, of course, in which we could praise the principle of the school in order to have a blackboard to, to actually teach students. However, he, did, he didn't or she didn't realize that, uh, that he needed to cut some of the re longitudinal reinforcement. And uh, so you see the columns that were cut in order <clears throat> to place the blackboard, they were trained to place the blackboard. And certainly uh, these are those, this just tell us that we don't have the proper procedures for um, um, changing the sum of the, or modifying the structures, particularly in this case of school buildings. Supposedly they, they, they should not do this. They should have the advice of the, of the local uh, institute related to the school infrastructure and this, this kind of thing should not happen, but, but it does happen as you could see here in this slide. And uh, Professor Miranda, thank you very much. And I hope I have, I have achieved what you, you wanted me to talk about. And I, have, I hope I've done it in the time that you have a lot of me. Thank you very much. Sergio. Uh, that, that was a great presentation. And uh, in particular, that 
uh, last photo that you showed really summarizes what the learning from earthquake program it's all about one image it's it's worth a thousand images i mean a thousand words and it really summarized the many problems that we still have to address uh we've received lots and lots of questions and uh we've been trying to answer all of them uh but there are literally like probably hundreds of questions uh i will just mention a couple here we we unfortunately ran out of time um uh, but there were some some questions regarding the the different magnitudes that that we touched on and uh professor shirley campos uh who's a seismologist well known in mexico he uh, help us she helped us clarify that the small differences are just due to the number of stations that usgs uses here and some of the methods and uh and they're they're both correct and up to date uh but it's normal to have this this small differences especially one tenth of a of a magnitude. Uh, there was a question regarding the early warning system uh, and its uh, expansion to other states. And uh, I don't know if you could comment on that, Juan Manuel. Uh, in particular, Flavio was asking about the expansion to Veracruz, uh, Chiapas, and, and some other states. We have 96. We have 96 sensors and we believe that the coverage should be extended to 160. This is the recommendation of geotechnicians and seismologists. Um, in places where coverage still needs to be extended, there are some states in the southeastern region, rather towards Chiapas, that are still not incorporated into the system. There was an experience with very simple equipment that has not actually borne uh, the appropriate results. We had a very harsh experience with the um, um, earthquake of the Tehuantepec uh, Gulf in Chiapas, a borderline. And it was a good opportunity to have seen the quality of performance of these elements. So the contrast should have been made with SASMEX, but something was re regrettable because actually in Chiapas, they did not have an alert um, system. This is still a challenge. I am so sorry. The sound is a little bit choppy. Sometimes this is due to political decisions, but we are quite interested in, uh, that is the government need, know, knows that the networks have to be expanded and extended. And we have been lucky with the, the Wantepec Gulf earthquake. Um, in many years of relapses and recurrences, we had a chance to record them. The result was very good for the unit, except for the fact that the coverage was not the ideal one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, it really boils down to priorities. And when it comes to policy and politics, it, it gets very complicated in both sides of the of the um, of the border. Just to give you an idea that uh, here in the state of California, the former governor uh, sort of was enthusiastic about the support. Uh, but didn't provide the, the funding, but the current uh, governor did provide. So it's now uh, being implemented and expanded. But but it's, you know, when, when you put it in terms of, of the budgets of these large governments, it's, it's really tiny what it's needed, uh, but it really comes to political will uh, to set the correct priorities. There was, there was another question um, there were, there were actually several questions regarding the differences in intensity in different cities uh, that were mentioned. And uh, again, uh, Professor uh, Perez Campos helped us uh, clarify that, that some of these differences are probably mainly due to, to directivity effects uh, as opposed to this, this small discrepancy in, in magnitudes. And, and, and one of the things that, that Professor Alcocer mentioned that it's, that it's key and we, we're still learning pretty much all over the world is this issue of the non-structural components. 
and he touched on the importance of enforcement. Uh, in California, we're fortunate to have a very good state agency that looks at this in hospitals, uh, but there's no equivalent agency in Mexico or other countries. Uh, and, and this is really needed. It's, it's very, very complicated. Many hundreds, if not thousands of different kinds of non-structural components. And as Anna Lang commented, uh, this is a key aspect now that we're talking about functional recovery and, and attempting to go to higher performance levels. I think with that, unfortunately, we're gonna have to uh, wrap up. I want to thank everyone for, for your participation. Uh, we have very large uh, number of attendees. I hope that, that you found a lot of interesting information. And I want to mention again, uh, please visit our website where you will find uh, the ERI report, the GEAR report, and other reports that, that are being produced will be uploaded to this same site. And uh, thank you for your interest in ERI, in SMIS, and we hope that we will continue with this, with this collaboration with bilingual webinars and perhaps replicate those in other parts of Latin America. Uh, thank you very much and please stay tuned. We will have another uh, webinar on the Taiwan earthquake that actually occurred the day before this one. Uh, the Learning from Earthquakes program also uh, had an enthusiastic group of participants putting that together and, uh, and uh, we'll be here uh, working for future earthquakes, but, but we need your help and, and please join us in this effort. Maggie, I pass it on to you. Great, thank you, Eduardo, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, we will have a recording of the webinar available on the Learning from Earthquakes website. You'll receive a follow-up email with the link to that and, and more information about today's webinar. Um, and please take our post-webinar survey, you'll see pop up and in the email. Um, and it really helps us give feedback so we can improve our uh, future events. And just thank you everyone for attending and um, final thanks to all of our speakers. Thank you. Gracias, thank you. Gracias, Eduardo. Abrazo, Héctor, gracias. A ustedes, gracias.